everyone. All right, it's about time I do my first tutorial for this channel then. Uh, I got so many requests on the last video that I thought I'd go ahead with this one. Um, one of the first comments was about a uh, picture frame builder. Uh, and I thought a tutorial having a go at building something like that might be a great introduction for a lot of people to GeoScript. Um, so I guess I'll show you the tool working uh, first. Basically what it what it does is you feed into it a material uh, that contains your uh, picture. So I'll just show you that off now. Um, so for example, here's this, here's this picture. Um, it's just a square material at first, but within it is this texture, which is just, you know, all this stuff's just royalty free, um, public domain art. And you, yeah, you can find it around on the internet somewhere. So what it does is it reads from this texture, um, which I'll just show you the material graph here. Or all, all that matters is this node here. This is a texture sample and it's, I've just labeled it diffuse. And so you've got to bear that in mind for later. The, this here is just something that gives it a bit of a bump uh, map. So, you know, you don't really have to worry about this. You can, I just made this in um, Substance Designer and then I've just added it as a normal um, and specular and roughness. And it just gives the images that little bit of kind of crackly bump, but it's not important for the tutorial. It's just an extra kind of effect just to sell the, the illusion of a painting. So yeah, what it does is um, it takes that, it, it finds that uh, um, image within the material and then it scales everything proportionately and drops in this uh, picture frame mesh around the image. So you can see here just a handle that defines the, the height and then the width follows from that. So it's just scaling accordingly. You can see that it's it's scaling the picture frame as a ratio and it also can deal with portrait images landscape whatever you want and you know the material is also scaling the the bump texture accordingly as well so yeah i'll just go in and try and explain some of the concepts as we go i'm not going to um pin together bit by bit the blueprint graph I'm just going to go over what I've got and explain it and do diagrams as I go. And yeah, hopefully that's helpful for some of you as a jumping off point for Ge GeoScript. Um, a few things I should say before we start, and that's what this tutorial assumes. So it assumes that you have already um, imported the, or migrated I should say, the GeoScript example from the Lyra demo. So once you've done that, you'll end up with you know, these base classes, so baked generated mesh actor, the editor actions, and the, um, you know, here, here's all those tools. You'll recognize them if you've looked at the content in the Lyra demo. They're all just here. I've just put them in an unused folder and just made some of my own. Um, everything that the blueprint we're going to be working on is just a child uh, blueprint of the baked generated mesh actor. Um, it also, this tutorial also assumes you know something about Unreal texturing and parameters and things like that, but you can cut, you could kind of figure it out yourself as well a little bit. And it also assumes you know something about um, 3D poly modeling as well, because we're going to be using a simple um, mesh that I brought in that I modeled in Blender, but you could model it in any other program. But I'm not going to show that here. I'm just going to assume that you know how to do that. All right, so here's the blueprint itself. Um, yeah, so what a bake generated mesh is, is a temporary mesh that you can manipulate. Uh, and eventually once you're done manipulating it, you can bake it out to a static mesh um, that will actually be, can be used in game as a prop, as a piece of landscape, whatever you need. Uh, it can be nanitized, you can, yeah. It's, it just becomes a standard asset that you would otherwise have to import from an external 3D program. And the tools that let you manipulate that generated mesh are called Geometry Script, uh, and they take the form of a plugin, which can be enabled here in the plugins area, surprisingly. Um, and yeah, they take the form of a series of 
nodes. So, uh, geometry script. There you go. There's a whole load of them. All of them responsible for different things you can do to your generated mesh before it's baked out. Um, but I'm going to focus on now having played around with them for a few months where, I, you know, I'm going to focus on my particular approach, but by no means is this the the true way to do it. This is just how I found is the most efficient because there's definitely some nodes in geometry script which are quicker than others. Some of them do take quite a long time uh, to process. So I've just focused on the ones that get the job done the quickest and the most efficiently in in terms of CPU time. So the primary way I like to work is by layering appended compute meshes. So I'll try and explain what that means. There's kind of there's kind of two types of mesh at play when you're using um, the generated mesh. There's the generated mesh itself, which is what you can see in the editor. You can actually view the generated mesh. Um, but there's also a compute mesh. Now a compute mesh you can't see. The editor won't render it, but it allows you to layer in extra meshes to the generated mesh. So essentially you can use them to allocate, transform and manipulate a mesh in almost like imaginary space and then you can commit that mesh to the generated mesh where it finally becomes visible again. So my workflow tends to be, um, okay, you know, allocate a an empty compute mesh which has no geometry into it. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the picture, for example, you can see it's the picture itself is just a box. It's just a box with a with a, an image projected onto it, um, and the frame is something else entirely. So you'd say, okay, add a rectangle into that as geometry into into the compute mesh, extrude it two centimeters, uh, rotate it so it's upright on the wall, uh, then scale it so it it matches the handle um, then what I want to do is I want to commit that to the generated mesh so I will I will go ahead and append that mesh to the generated mesh so that will that will go in there and the next thing I'll do is I'll create a new uh, I'll allocate a new compute mesh which starts completely empty no geometry into it and I'll say uh, okay well you know, look at the frame. There's kind of four pieces of wood on that frame. Uh, let's start with the base piece, and we'll we'll maybe we'll maybe cut it at 45 degrees at the end, um, and then rotate it so it's also facing the wall. Then I'll append that to the to the uh, generated mesh so it's visible, and I'll just go along a bit like a factory conveyor belt. You know, with different parts of the factory making bits and then there's a final conveyor belt which is the which is the um, generated mesh which which finally receives all those parts and allows us to view it and it will eventually become baked out into a static mesh okay so I'll go over my um, nodes now step by step so yeah this first node is just the generated mesh uh, rebuild function that comes with the bait generated mesh actor when you when you migrate it from Lyra uh, and it just gives you a pin for the generated mesh itself uh, this branch is just a bit of paranoia from me it just makes sure that uh, whenever I'm done editing the, these blueprints I just untick them so if they do happen to fire at runtime I don't know if they do yet because this is all a bit experimental they just hit this and nothing you don't get all this this stuff which would cause a huge stutter in the system um, this is a bit more important so what this does is it um, and th this is also in the Lyra thing but they have it reset to cube for some reason but I've just set it to reset so all, all this does is it means that you are not getting a build up of geometry so if you don't re if you don't reset your your generated mesh every time it's rebuilt you'll you'll just have geometry pile up and pile up like the same geometry over and over and over again um, and it, it just bogs the whole system down so this just 
it means that on every rebuild you just get that reset to an empty shape uh it's pretty important because yeah I, for a week or so i was like why is this getting slower every time i use it uh yep so this is just making a uh local instance of the of the of the mesh of the generated mesh for convenience that means we don't have to draw loads of lines out everywhere for it um right so there's two all i'm using for this pitch frame is two allocated compute meshes so one of them is comp one which is which is just an empty space that i'm going to use to put all the separate bits into um but after each bit i'm going to reset it every time but i'll, I'll show that as we get to it uh, and then this one is the frame part now this is the one thing that you you could potentially produce in geometry script you could um, draw out a polygonal shape using coordinates but i've taken the easy route and what i'm doing here is i'm taking an existing static mesh which is the which is a, a slice a profile of the picture frame that i've made in blender and it's just 10 units wide so it's very small it's 10 centimeters long um and that just acts as our profile for the entire picture frame so and then what i need to do is i need to give this compute mesh which is called frame part i need to feed that geometry into it so it's basically making an active copy of that static mesh it takes all that geometry uh, and all the tangents and all the normals and everything and it copies it to this now active compute mesh so we can do things to it we can chop into it rotate it, and do whatever we want um yeah that's all that's doing uh, and this is just a little warning if we don't have a uh a profile mesh assigned um but yeah all right so this was a bit of a tricky bit to do this is where we get our dimensions from the material so what this does annoyingly there's no way to do it as far as i know from a child an instance a material instance you have to make a dynamic material in instance on the fly um, and then then it'll get then you can derive your properties from it so all this does is it takes the material that we the the instance that we have for our painting which is i think for this one it's a bat is the default one um it then converts that to a dynamic material instance which is only used by this blueprint it can then find the texture parameter which is diffuse if you remember from a minute ago just you've got to remember to name your parameter exactly then uh, it can yeah we have to cast to that texture then we can get <laughs> then we can get the the size y and the size x in pixels uh, and this is pretty valuable because this defines the width so if i go back to the actual um object itself the height is set by me manually but the 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 whole mesh has to decide what the width is based on the ratio of height to width in the original texture if that makes sense and that's all we're doing here we're just making those calculations so we've got the y size and the x size based on the height of the handle which is this here which by the way is just a vector and to get it to show up in the editor you just tick here you just tick show 3d widget and then you can get you can mess around with it pretty simple all right so that's all that function does is it just it just derives the the calculated uh width and height of the picture but remember this is it's almost as if this is flat on a table so it's not upright yet so our x and our x and y here will not um tally with the x and y of our next task which is to append the box and here is that box append um i just want to draw attention to the fact that I'm appending to comp one so I'm adding a box to that empty comp one that we set 
down here. So that's the empty version. Now we're adding our first piece of geometry to it. Um, but one thing I'm always, before I explain what else is going on here, one thing I'm always aware of is where the center of our, um, our mesh actually is, where that blueprint actor is. So wherever you place that, that blueprint in the world, that's your zero, zero, zero location in world space. So your width, depth, and height um, are represented by these three numbers. So when you place a, a box in this case, um, these these append nodes tend to have an origin. Sometimes they don't, but with boxes they do. And you can see the origin is its base. That means, let's say, the box, let's say you're here, this X is where you've placed your... Um, your blueprint actor well the box is going to spawn halfway across the the horizontal axis but um it's also going to spawn above vertically so it's kind of spawning here so in order to get it to sit you look at the case of the um the blueprint here it's not it's naturally wanting to sit on the top of this uh, pivot here so in order to get it to sit in the right place, which would be here, we're going to need to move it over by half its width, or half the width of the um, in the intended width. So that's what we're doing here. So I'm just setting, you see I'm setting the size of the width, the height, which is the Y into the Z dimension, and the depth, which I've just made into a variable here, which is just two centimeters. Uh, then yes, I'm transforming it by half of the width. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. And that's pretty much the essence of appending nodes to to objects with generated meshes. Is It's it's just an art of appending a mesh and moving into the correct position, ready to be comped together with the generated mesh. Okay, so the next node is pretty simple. All this is doing is it's remapping the material IDs. So this this finished thing has two materials. It's got the um, painting itself, uh, and then it's got the material, which is just a generic wood material that the frame is using. So the finished, uh, the the finished. If I click one of these, the finished mesh needs to have two material slots, um, which starts with zero. So we've got element zero and element one. What we're doing here is we're just moving, we're just reallocating this mesh that we've just appended to, from material ID 0 to material ID 1, which means it will use material ID 1, which we then assign later on. So that I'll just go, I'll skip to this now to to fulfill this uh, this point, but this this is just the standard stuff that comes in with the Lyra demo as well. So all, all this does is it assigns these two materials to those two slots so again these are just material instances the frame material and the picture material that's it and that's ready to get baked out to to the static mesh okay so the next set of nodes is a bit more complicated um what it deals with is the scaling of the uvs so the uvs are basically a way to organize the projection of textures on 3D objects when it comes to th any 3D modeling or game dev. Um, and GeoScript has a whole load of tools that let you manipulate UVs. But in this case, the default UVs that come with appending a box are okay to work with because they're just a, a simple flat projection onto each face of the cube. Um, but the problem you run up against is that though the default projection is trying to constantly project a perfect one by one square so i'll show you what happens if i get rid of these nodes um so if i just like go straight over here uh compile what's going to happen is the the painting is now the correct width but its height is is stretched because the the default texture projection is a is a perfect square so you lose this bottom third of the painting even though still the, the derived texture size is, is scaling the the geometry correctly the texture projection is wrong so the texture projection needs to be altered so it 
it fits correctly with the with the picture frame itself and that's what this this set of nodes does uh, the challenge the main challenge is that one this would normally work except when the um, height of the painting becomes greater than the width and then it stops working so that's what this um, that's what this branch is doing it just says if the X size is greater than the Y size then do this if not then do that um, and then you always get it always makes sure that the ratio of the painting is correct in in terms of UV projection okay then finally for this uh, strand uh, we're going to commit the mesh to the um, generated mesh. So if you remember what I was saying here, we've now done everything we need to do with this compute mesh and we're going to commit it to the generated mesh so we can see it. So up until now we couldn't see any of this, none of it would render in the uh, in the editor. The editor only renders the final thing, not the, not the process. So that's all this does. It just it's just another append. So it's the same the same kind of function as appending a box. It's just we're appending our edited uh, geometry to something that's viewable. And finally, we're going to reset that uh, comp mesh. So we we've used it here. We you know we can see all the way through. We added a box. We changed the UVs to it. We then added it to the generated mesh. And now we're done with it. We can reset it back to an empty space, meaning we can use it again on the next leg, which is what we're getting to now. So the frame is slightly more complicated, but basically the same principle. There's just a bit more going on. So you can see here's that frame part, which is the mesh that I that I added the uh, the static mesh geometry to, and we're we're appending that to comp one, which is what we just cleared. So this is fresh, ready to go. We're appending the part to it and then we're scaling it. So here what's happening is we're taking that 10 centimeter uh, piece that is the is the mesh we're deriving and we're then adding a bit of excess because in a minute we're going to cut on 45 degrees. But just to be safe, we're going to add some excess on either side for us to cut off so we don't get kind of weird square edges left behind. So the cut excess is just a it's just a fixed variable of 20 uh, times 2. So we're going to add 20 to either end. Uh, then we're dividing that length by 10 because frustratingly, the scale is on a 0 to 1 value. So it's basically, you know, uh, okay, you've got we've you've appended your part now now scale it based on a, a multiple rather than an actual scale, but hey, that's what we've got to live with. So that's why we divide by 10 there. Uh, then we've got to move it. Um, we've got to move it over. so i'll I'll try and explain what's happening here in the diagram. So let's get rid of this. And let's draw our center point again. So again, imagine where the blueprint actor is. What we're doing is we're dropping that little 10 centimeter piece on here. We're then scaling it to the correct width. Let me do this. We're then adding 20 centimeters and then another another 20 centimeters. But then we're going to have to move the whole thing over so we've got 20 centimeters off either side so we're going to move it over yeah we're going to move it over so that we've got 20 centimeters there the correct length and then an extra 20 centimeters so that's that's what's happening in this first step okay so the next step is then the cuts obviously uh, it's just two cuts to give you these the 45 degree angles. So if I if I go in close, if you look at real picture frames, there is actually a 45 degree cut just to really kind of sell it. And you they join the uh, they join the two pieces of wood like that. Um, but yeah, so the way that's working is the first cut location is at zero 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 zero. So as I was explaining before, three zeros is right at the center of your 
a blueprint actor and it's just cutting at 45 degrees from that point next one is is the inverse so it's minus 45 degrees on the y-axis but the location is z is z0 y0 but x is the width that we derived earlier of the, the whole thing so it's it's over here and it's cutting that way so then basically what you end up is that final piece what you end up with there you go okay so once we've got that bottom end of the frame all we then to get the top end all we need to do is just mirror that part um it's the only trick with this with this mirror function is is working out where the the center of the mirror is so let let me just try and explain how the mirror works but if you've used any 3d program before like blender then this will all make sense it's just kind of using blender but in the dark <laughs> everything's completely invisible to you so let's say this is where our potential picture frame should go um we've now got this part okay so then all we need to do is place a mirror here and we we basically get the top of the picture frame there that's all we're doing we're just going to mirror that across um and then yeah that's that's all that's doing just mirroring that part so now we've got the, the top and the bottom uh now box project projecting uvs now i mentioned before that the uvs from appending a box were fine we just needed to scale them properly um but what we've done here because we've mirrored and we've 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 scaled and we've stretched we we've um we've really stretched our original uvs from our frame part so what we need to do is reset them um and a simple way to do that is just use a box projection and a box projection all it does is let's say you have um added a cube to your compute mesh um all a box projection does is it it does what it says on the tin it projects outwards from every face in six degrees so it will just align the textures properly scale properly in six degrees out from a box which is okay it's not perfect for picture frames but you don't really you know okay if you look really closely you can see some repeated texture but that is kind of realistic it's kind of how the wood would be you'd cut into the grain and you'd see that repeated pattern but yeah you can kind of get away with it um, but it's not it wouldn't be perfect obviously if you were in blender you would unwrap this shape kind of differently but for our purposes perfectly fine no worries okay then just like before with the picture itself we we're going to commit the mesh to the the uh, generated mesh and clear the comp so that's all exactly the same as it was before and the next the next set of frames uh it's just the same thing just the only thing that's happening that's different is we rotate the mesh through 90 degrees halfway through the process so it's the same as uh the same as this but halfway halfway through we're just going to rotate the rotation is is here and we rotate the whole thing 90 degrees and make sure the cuts are flowing in the opposite directions so they all match up and again we do a mirror so it's the exact same thing as before we're just we're creating something across here uh, cutting it rotating it mirroring it and then we've basically got the whole frame there it's just a case of working out the dimensions and the rotation and the cuts and changing those uh, accordingly but otherwise it's really just the same process um but yeah so yeah that's pretty much it this is just the same as before this just sets the materials and then releases any potential compute meshes that we've we might have left open uh, and this is ready to get baked out so let's say i start over with a new one so I'll drop this into the level um and then all i need to do is choose the painting material uh instance which is here yep and it automatically snaps to the correct size and all i need to do is scale it and uh, hit generate new static mesh 
swap to static mesh and that's it you have a a static mesh painting which i think is also nanite as well so yep there you go well i hope this has got your brains ticking on the possibilities of geoscript um but let me know if there's anything you want me to talk about or show in another video down in the comments uh, and i'll do my best <laughs>